to come on up. At this time, I'm going to ask the Outwood family if they would read our scripture lesson for today, and then after that, the kids will be released. Brandon, thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay, here you guys go. It's Owen's going to start. He's got Owen. his Bible right here. Okay, and here's your microphone. It's on. At the time, the Roman Emperor Augustus decreed that the that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. This was the f- first census taken when Quirinus Quirin- was governor of Syria. Syria. All returned to their own ancestral towns to register for the census. I mean, register for the census. And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judah, David's ancient home. He traveled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee. He took with him Mary, to whom he was engaged, who was now expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for her baby to be born. She gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no lodging available for them. That night, there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified, but the angel reassured them, don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. And you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth lying in a manger. Suddenly the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. When the angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, Let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing that has happened which the Lord has told us about. They hurried to the village and found Mary and Joseph, and there was the baby lying in the manger. After seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angel had said to them about this child. All who heard the shepherd's story were astonished. But Mary kept all these things in her heart and thought about them often. The shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen. It was just as the angel had told them. Thank you, Atwood men. Great job, all three of you. Appreciate it. So you've heard the reading of God's word today. Uh, Thank you, Atwoods, again. Jesus should have been born to an important family. Think about who Jesus is, who he claimed to be. Jesus should have been born to an important family, and he should have been born in an important location. There should have been no scandal around his parentage or the birth location. And the first witnesses should have at least been of a class of people that could testify in a court of law. Come on. At least these minimum requirements should have met if we're going to prop up Jesus as the Son of God, the Savior of the world. If this is the story we're going to tell, it should have had a better beginning. But instead... Jesus was born into the womb of an unwed teenage girl who had found great favor in the sight of God, not for her parentage, her lineage, but because of her devotion, because of her faith in, G- in, her faith in God. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14 foretold, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. Jesus was born in a place kind of like Newcastle, Indiana. It was a backcountry village, 
a place that many people may not have even known where it was. They'd have to look it up on the map, kind of like the first time I was invited to, to meet the good people of Newcastle, Indiana. I said, I think I can find Indiana on the map. <laughs> yeah, that's where I was at. I think in 2000, that was a 2000, I think I can find Indiana on the map. I know I've flown over it. It's true, right? We all know. They call us a flyover state. I've been here for 12 years now, so I consider myself a Hoosier. My two children are born in Newcastle Hospital. We're Newcastleinians now. <laughs> but we've got to understand that God can do great things in places that people can't find on a map. And God can use people born of unwed teenage girls. You see, it was foretold in Micah chapter 5, verse 2. But as for you, Bethlehem, too little to be among the clans of Judah. From you, one will go forth from me to be ruler in Israel. His goings forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. Jesus' birth was witnessed by animals, angels, shepherds, and an un and a teenage girl with her carpenter husband. The miracle of Jesus' birth is not only found in the incarnation, that God, who is spirit, took on flesh and dwelt among us. The miracle of Jesus' birth is not only found in the virgin birth, that Joseph and Mary had not yet consummated their marriage when she was already pregnant with child, but also... The miracle of Jesus is found in the scandal to the power structures of those God came to save and redeem. God did not send his son in the way that the world would have expected him to send his son. The Messiah came in a way that was undetectable except for those who knew the word of God and were looking for him to come in the way that God had foretold. And the fact that it happened in a way that no powerful person would want the story of his or her birth to be told is evidence in and of itself of the authenticity of the greatest story ever told. Because if we were making this story up in order to begin a world religion, a movement, we would not have told it this way. Because this is not the way powerful people would begin their story. This is not the way of the world. This is a way that baffles the power structures, the principalities. Now we've talked about this before. This is one of my favorite subjects. I love talking about the scandal of Christmas because we've normalized, we've habitualized Christmas in our culture and even the unbelievers celebrate Christmas without understanding the depth of the love and the scandal of grace and the passion of the Christ for which he came. You see, this scandal is of epic proportions. Christmas was very different on purpose because on that first Christmas, love was born. Love was born and made manifest to the world of the love of a God that wanted his people brought back into his family. You see, Christmas was not a worldly power play. Unlike Caesar, I think it's very interesting. The reason I wanted you to hear all of Luke chapter two is because I wanted you to hear the power play of the world. You see, Caesar's census was a power play. Caesar wanted to show the world how powerful he was by counting how many people were under his authority and saying, see how many subjects I have. See how great of a territory my empire is. I am powerful and I can make you take your pregnant wife on a long journey because I'm Caesar, 
and you will do what I tell you to do or I will kill you. See, that's a worldly power play. It's threatening, it's manipulating. But that's not the way of God. You see, Christmas is the birth of love where God entered his creation compelled by love to become one of his people. You see, Caesar was so focused on showing the world how powerful he was by counting all of his people, God wanted to show the world how powerful he was by becoming one of his people. Because the power of God is his love. And he birthed his power. He birthed his love into Jesus Christ. Galatians chapter 4 a beautiful, beautiful teaching, verses 4 to 7. And I'm going to read that to you straight from the scriptures. Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 through 7. One of Paul's letters says this. But when the fullness of the time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive the adoption of sons. Because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. And ladies, I want you to hear, when you are called a son of God, that is not a gender issue. That is talking about you having legal rights you have legal rights to all the promises of God. You are a co-heir of grace. You see, the birth of love was broadcasted. And we hear this in John 3, 3 16 to 17. This is, I love in these big moments of the church, like the Christmas season, the season of Advent. I love using the scriptures that are so familiar because we need to know these familiar scriptures and how they're connected to the most important story ever told that has become so familiar. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And then verse 17, for God did not send his son into the world to judge the world. but that the world might be saved through him. You see, verse 17 says, God did not send his son to do a power play. God sent his son to birth love, to show his compassion, to show his mercy, to show the judgment of God fulfilled for the peoples, to bring all nations back unto himself. Christmas is the birth of love. Christmas is the fulfillment of the Abrahamic promise that every nation shall be blessed through these people because God's love did not just exclusively belong to the nation of Israel, but God's love flowed through the womb of Mary so that all nations could feel and experience the deliverance and rescue of a love for all people. And he did it in a way that was a scandal on purpose because his love of all people is hard for us people to understand. It's hard for us to understand a love of all people because we have a discriminatory love as humans. But God has an unambiguous, clear, focused, clear, laser sharp love that comes from his very character. Love compelled God that first Christmas. John declared in 1 John 3, 1 John 3, 1 to 3. Let's, once again, let me open up the scriptures to you. 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 to 3. See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us. Bestow is a, a term of royal favor. Bestow is connected to the concept of grace. Grace and bestowal. It, it's royalty. This is royalty. This is a king bestowing favor. Like a, like a presidential pardon. It's official. See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us that we would be called children of God. 
And such we are for this reason, for this reason, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, this is who you are here. God is calling you beloved, beloved, sons and daughters of the king, beloved. Now we are children of God. Just like the Galatians 4 scripture pointed, you are now a son of God. You now have right of inheritance. You now have the promise of Abraham to you and through you. You, we are children of God, and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him just as he is. And everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he is pure. I love this passage and I chose it because we've got to remember that the Advent season has this double view. It's this view of what has happened and it's a view of what will happen. And this scripture brings it out so clearly. You see, Advent isn't just the celebration of Christ's first coming, it's the anticipation of his second coming. You see, the Advent season, why we, it's connected to Christmas and we say the Christmas season, but the Advent season is both the anticipation of what will be and how we live our lives because we fully anticipate the coming of Christ to redeem all things and make all things right. We anticipate that. That gives us hope. And the reason we can have that unwavering hope is because he has fulfilled his promise through the first coming of Jesus. Christmas is a declaration that God is faithful to his promise, that when God prophesies, that the Messiah will come through a virgin into a backcountry town which seems scandalous and impossible and foolish in the eyes of all power structures and all peoples. If he can do that, then imagine what he can do through you in Newcastle, Indiana, as we anticipate and prepare for his second coming. Because the same promises of love that were birthed in Jesus that we proclaim and celebrate is now your promise to live so that all the peoples will know why Christ came and why he's returning because God wants this love to be birthed in you and through you so that all peoples can know of the love of the Father and be brought home to his household. And that's why we support you know, sending shoeboxes around the world so that the gospel will go forth through this practical demonstration of love. That's why we feed people, so that bridges will be built for the gospel of Jesus by meeting people's needs. This is why we have volunteers who spend countless hours decorating this facility to look different for one month out of the year because it is a high, holy time for the church that must be set aside and made different to remind us that every day has been made holy by Jesus' coming. We do these things on purpose because it's who we are. We are compelled by the Holy Spirit who lives in us to pass on the love that was birthed in us. I want you to hear from John, the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 12 to 14. I want you to hear how the love of God came. I love the Gospel of John, and I love how the Christmas story of John is so different in its presentation than the synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So John, chapter 1, verses 12 to 14, listen to this. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. This is what was birthed to us that Christmas morning. This is the gift that God gave us when he birthed love. He gave us himself, full of truth 
and grace. Now, because of what has been birthed into us, the promise of Emmanuel, what does Emmanuel mean? God with us. Because of the promise, you're, you're with me, right? Because of the promise of the gift of love birthed into us, Christ is with us, full of grace and truth, full of the word and the spirit, full of, full of the compassion for people of all nations. We are now then compelled by that love, by the Holy Spirit, to bring that love to others as an evidence of the manifestation of who God says he is and came to demonstrate who he is because Jesus is the fullness of deity dwelling so that we can know the Father and come to the Father. And we become the ambassadors of that love. We become the messengers of that hope. Go with me to 1 John chapter 4 because I want to substantiate how practical today's teaching is to you and how every day, moment by moment, practical, the call of seizing the moment of knowing the word of God, memorizing the word of God, internalizing the word of God, praying the word of God so that you'll be ready to bring this grace and truth to others. 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 to 21. Beloved, that's you. Who's the beloved? You are the beloved. What a humbling term. God has bestowed his favor upon you. Because of his kind intentions, he has given you his love so that you would be known as the beloved of God. Beloved. When you look in the mirror, who do you see? Do you see the beloved of Jesus when you look in the mirror? The world would have you see yourself in the ways of worldly power place. And on there you, you land on some scale. Somewhere on the scale of the world, you'll look at yourself in the mirror. But that's not the way you're supposed to look in your mirror. When you look in the mirror, I hope you'll see the beloved of God. And that'll shape your identity and shape your purpose for the day and shape how you do relationships and shape how you communicate. Listen to this. Beloved, let us love one another for love is from God and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Do you hear how love is birthed not only at the first coming of Christ Jesus but then through the spirit in each person who puts their faith in him so that the love of God that's been birthed in us will be extended to all the nations because of the hope of glory that one day Christ will return for his bride and we will be found ready and we have been faithful to the gospel proclamation. We have been found faithful to to proclaiming love to the nations without boundaries. Verse 8, the one who does not love does not know God. Hmm. For God is love. By this the love of God was manifested, made evidence in us that God has sent his only begotten son into the world so that we might live through him. Why did the first Christmas happen? So that we might live through him. Verse 10. In this is love, not that we love God, no, but that he loved us. And he sent his son to be the propitiation, the satisfaction for sin, for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given of his Holy Spirit. We have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. And whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides. God makes his home in him and he in God. We have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. God is love. And the one who abides in love, the one who makes his home in love abides in God and God abides in him. You keep hearing this, this relationship. 
By this, love is perfected with us. Us, the beloved of God. This is you, this is us, so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so also are we in this world. Victorious. Verse 18, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves punishment and the one who fears is not perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him that the one who loves God should love his brother also. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And whoever loves the father loves the child born of him. Wow. And I could just keep reading. Just wash the, you with the word of God. Just sanctify you through the reading of the word of God. Because these are the promises of God. And this is the command of God today. This is the command of God for every day. This is the moment that we can seize. Because every moment of your life is a providential opportunity to manifest or bring evidence to the world of God's love. Of why he came and why we celebrate Christmas. And why Christmas is, yes, a set apart and hell high holy time in the church but it's an everyday reality of how we live our lives because christ has birthed his love into us so that we would live in his love not so that we would simply look forward to it once a year and be generous once a year but so that we would live in his love that we would make it a rhythm a habit of our life that this is why we live this is the command of god for each of us this and every season Give to others what God first birthed into your heart, mind, body, and soul. May your life become the evidence, the manifestation of God's love that the Father has made his dwelling place in you, that Emmanuel has come and God is with us. You have been blessed to be a blessing. Now to empower you for this journey i'm going to read over you one last scripture and then we're going to have the worship team come up and we are going to respond and may our yes be yes and our no be no and may we walk from this place with the integrity of our faith of who we say christ is of why christ came and how we can live the victorious life of christmas of love let's go to luke chapter one Luke chapter 1, we read today, thank you Atwood boys, we read today Luke chapter 2, and now we're going to conclude with Luke 1, 46 to 55, and I want us to pray in agreement with this magnificent song given to us by Mary in the scriptures. Luke 1, verses 46 to 55. And you hear so much depth and beauty and power. My soul exalts the Lord. And my spirit has rejoiced in God, my Savior. For he had, has had regard for the humble state of his bond slave. For behold, from this time on all generations will count me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me and holy is his name i believe we can all pray in agreement with this as the beloved of god and his mercy is upon generation after generation toward those who fear him he has done mighty deeds with his arm he has scattered those who were proud in the thoughts of their heart. He has brought down rulers from their thrones and has exalted those who were humble. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent away the rich empty-handed. He has given help to Israel, his servant, in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and his descendants forever. Hallelujah. Amen and amen. All praise and glory to our Almighty Father in heaven.
Father, we are the descendants of Abraham. That you have grafted us into Israel, into the chosen people of God, and we together with your chosen people have received a rich inheritance. Lord, you have done great and mighty deeds to make this so. We have proclaimed that today in the receiving of communion. We have lit the candle of love and remembrance of your great love that sent forth your Son so that we may be forgiven of sins. Jesus Christ, the propitiation of sins. You have satisfied the wrath of the Father for all sin by dying on the cross. We put our faith in you and we ask you that you would forgive us our sins and separate us from our sins as from the east as to the west. We thank you for this pardon and we bestow the pardon of God upon all of his children. You are forgiven in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit because Christ has proclaimed your forgiveness. Lord, we bow the knee to you and declare that you are the Son of God, the Savior of the world, dying on the cross, yet defeating death three days later. We put our faith in you, forever exalted with a name that is above all names so that every single person that declares the name of Jesus as Lord and Savior has already been, has already been judged and found consumed by the love of God. We thank you for the forgiveness of our sins and we now put our lot in with you, Jesus. You are our King, our Lord, our Savior. And we now live for you. Fill us with your Holy Spirit afresh today so that we may study your word, know your word, and live your word. That we may pray and have intimacy with the Father. And so that we may live in you and you and us, knowing that every moment of every day is an opportunity to bring your love to the nations, your love to our neighbors, your love to our co-workers, your love to fellow students, your love to each and every person. We live for this purpose and this purpose alone, and we declare it in this Advent season. Thank you, Jesus Christ, for coming. And thank you that you'll come again. We put our hope and our faith and our love in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us respond.